movie. So I was watching a movie with my, with my, with my youngest son. And there was a scene in this movie where a grandparent tells the child to do something. He says, no, but what is mommy going to say? And then the grandma says, she can't say anything. She's my child. And, and he wanted to tell me that. Like, did you hear that? That if Gogo was here, uh, and he says, I must do something, and you say something about it, she's going to say, you are his son, right? So, so the fact, well, if I'm sitting with my dad, and my son is there, and I'm son to him, that sonship that I have towards my father does not replace the fact that I am a father to this one. I am multidimensional. So also are you in your walk with God. And that's why we talk about the necessity of discernment when you walk with people. Where, where you know that I know, this is no longer my friend just speaking. There's, there's a shift that's taken place. This, this, we were just having, because you know, you, you know how the things of the spirit work. In one line, a person just shifts. In that same conversation, same tone, but you start saying, hey, no, no, this is, this is no longer you speaking. It's like you've now shifted to your place of appointment. And when you sense that, don't downplay it. I, I, just, had a, I had just had a thought this afternoon about how it is so important to generally in South Africa, especially in social media, we joke about everything. Right? It's, sometimes it's good, but sometimes it's not, it's not good because you, you then downgrade everything into, into, into a joke. You, you know when you know the voice of God, you can identify it anywhere. Somebody could be talking on a radio, in a commercial radio station about something, then you know this is the voice of God. In 2014, or 16, no, 14, I think. Between 2014 and 16, I don't remember when. I had a head-on collision with the spirit of depression. And you know how it attacked me? through a radio interview. I'm driving on a Saturday afternoon. I'm listening to SAFM, 6 p.m. every Sunday. I don't know if they still have, they had a gospel show. So me, I was one of those Christians. I knew where to find all the gospel shows on radio, you know. Um, a lady was being interviewed about how she survived depression. But as she spoke about depression, that spirit hit me through the radio. I went on almost a year battling with that thing, and I knew very well. And when it happened, I quickly switched uh, 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 the, the radio. And, and, and here's, what, here's what the Holy Spirit said to me. He said, on radio that day, they put a lady who was never delivered from the spirit of depression. She was simply managing it. Because it's one thing to be delivered, it's one thing to manage something. And when she came to speak about it, she became a conduit through which it was flowing. So, so these mediums, spirits can flow through these mediums as much as the voice of God can flow through any medium. And when you are sensitive to people being multidimensional, that sometimes you could be in a conversation and a, and a person switches into the anointing, you, you, you start to... I think you, 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 you benefit a lot from the people that you live with. But if you are unable to have that spiritual intelligence, you are an antichrist because you are anti-anointing. You cannot recognize the anointing as it flows. Does this make sense? So, so there is that level of biblical interpretation where it's, it's more practical. It's the spiritual things becoming natural. And then there's a level of mystery. There's a level of mystery where, where God speaks to you in his own language. And the language of God, you've heard me say that truth is greater than language. He is able to communicate with you through what we call, that, that word is, the word mis, mystery in the Greek is the word mysterion. Meaning he speaks to you through hidden languages, through hidden things. Have you ever listened to people speak jargon in a particular industry? Like, you know, and then you're like, huh? 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 Uh, it does, like, what, what's going on right here? And then they turn and talk to you. 
<clears throat> and then you chuckle. <laughs> you know, you know that laughter when 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 you don't know what was said and you just laugh because <laughs> you're you're trying to be polite, you know. Or you just say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But hey, Dodo, we know that there it just went above your head. There, there is a language of God that is also like that. But, but that language of mystery is the language that the Spirit starts to communicate with you as he draws you much deeper. Listen to me, saints. One of the best things you can ever develop in your walk with God is sensitivity towards the Spirit. Exercise yourself towards these things. Unfortunately, they don't come naturally. They don't come by the laying on of hands. I get, a, I get a lot of that. You know, Apostle, just lay hands on me and impart the prophetic. You know, I, I get it so much. And, and there's a place for it. But the truth of the matter is that I can lay hands on you and give you what operates upon me, but I can never give you my history with God. There are things that can only be developed in your own history with God. And that history is written in the sacred place. It's forged in your own walk with God. And that's why... There are, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are demands at times that the Holy Spirit puts on you. And you know some of the demands is, like at two suddenly you are up. And you know, you're like, Lord, I just want to sleep. It's like, eh, tossing and turning. Don't go, don't go on Instagram. It's a demand. You know what, usually what's happening is, it's, he puts a demand because there's a mystery that is about to be revealed. So, so he must draw you, woo you in into a place of his language. That time where, when people who are experts in the field are talking and you're like, what, what's going on here? I know you're talking something important, but I don't understand. He wants to have that type of language with you. But what the Bible does and what Bible study uh, should be able to do for all of us is Bible study gives you vocabulary. L let, me, let, me, let me say this and then I'll, I'll get into what I want to say. If you're going to hear from God, one of the things that you need to develop is vocabulary. Okay? Because usually the Holy Spirit is going to give you senses and those senses will be connected to a scripture. Right? Like all things work together together. Uh, for the good, for those who love the Lord and are called according to his own purpose. You may not know the actual address, that is Romans 8, 28, but you know it. And there would, be, there would be stuff that will happen, and that will just pop out of your mind or out of your lips. Right? You know what that is? It's vocabulary, so that your, your, your contemporary language or your mind can find language to the mystery of what's unfolding in the inside of you. Because God never puts you in a situation that he does not speak to you about. So when you, like when you study Christian literature, you, you read books, you are, you are on, on daily devotions. Some point it may look like monotonous and you listen to, to preachings all the time. It may just look like. But what actually happens is that in the spirit, you develop vocabulary for revelation. Because the language of God is not the languages of men. He will drop something in you, but because you've been feeding yourself with word, suddenly it jumps out of you. You know what they say? Anything that gets squeezed, whatever that it, you are filled with comes out. Jesus puts it this way. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth. So let, let's, 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 let's elaborate on that a little bit. That is not necessarily an evil scripture. Well, it could mean, you know, you know there are people, okay, let's, let's start it at very low interpretation. No? There are people who, a person makes a joke, but it's not a joke. No? Yeah, it's from the abundance of the heart, the mouth, the mouth spoke. Yeah, you tell your friend, I'm getting married. And then... Answer is a jealous friend. Aha, we na na ne. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 what what would have happened at that time? Their their hearts uh, would have would have would have been revealed. Why? Uh, 
Because you know what jealousy means. Jealousy, when a person is jealous, it simply means you don't deserve it. Yeah, that's, 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 what, that's what it should not happen to you. So it could mean that. But also when the Lord Jesus Christ says from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, he says this first. He says, do you not know that a person is not defiled by what goes into him? Because there was an argument about the things that they feed themselves into. He says defilement and to be defiled means to be unclean. Okay, let me, let me explain what defilement means. That word to be defiled is actually such a spiritual term because it denotes to itself a place where an altar is established. Okay? When the Bible says uh, something is defiled, look at the, in Acts chapter 10, when Peter has a vision of a sheet that comes down from heaven, God says to him, kill and eat. And he says to him, I do not eat that which is defiled. By, by, he called that defiled because the animals that were on this sheet were all the animals in the book of Deuteronomy and in the book of Exodus. They were told that these animals are not befitting to be given as a sacrifice in the altar. You can give them in the altar, neither can you partake on these animals in, on, on the table because also table denotes the place of fellowship. Okay, I want you to think of two words. In the Greek, there are two words that I want you to discuss quickly. One, there's a word called kononia or kononia, kono, but its, it's, it's right pronunciation is kononia. And then there is a term called ecclesia. Kononia is a fellowship of oneness. Kononia is a fellowship of two people that are, so, so the marriage covenant, when they say people are in kononia, they are in that type of oneness. That type of agreement, okay, that is equal to the highest covenant that can exist between human beings. Because in heaven, the highest covenant between, between human beings is the marriage covenant, okay? So that's what's it's called kononia. And kononia will take place in the tables. So God will, will always set a scene around the table. You prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. When Jesus was about to go to the cross, what does he do? He has kononia with the disciples. He lifts up the cup. He says, this is my blood of the new covenant. He lifts up the bread. He says, this is my body broken for you. He brings them into kononia. Every kononia then leads to what we call ecclesia. Ecclesia is the term for the church in the, in the New Testament. But ecclesia is actually a legislature. It's a place where policies, where laws are discussed and dispensed. It's called, so, so the church, that word church is actually both a legal and a political term. But all ecclesias begins in kononia. But kononia is determined by altars. And altars will always, defy, will always determine what is defiled and what is not defiled. Okay, so Jesus says, whatever that you put in, it does not defile you. In other words, the, the altar of your heart, the place of worship and fellowship with God in you, is not determined by what you put in, but is determined by what comes out of you. Now, hold, walk with me. When you eat the word, what you are doing is, you are creating in your altar, kononia. And that kononia gives language and vocabulary to the altar that is set in your heart. When pressure comes on you, what comes out of you is what has developed by kononia in your heart. That's why if you want to know how mature people are, look at how they respond to difficulty. Because difficulties is what squeezes your altar to determine what kononia takes place there. If that kononia is correct, then ecclesia, the power to legislate, begins to come out. You can now speak to the circumstance. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he speaks to his disciples in, in, in Mark chapter 5, there's a storm around them and they're on the boat. He's, he's sleeping. Watch this with me. They go and wake him up. Lord, do you not care that we die? He rises, he doesn't say anything to them, he rebukes the storm. Then he turns and says to them, oh, you of little faith, 
I've always wondered about how am I of little, how were they of little faith? They were faced with the storm and they prayed. If anything, they received the answer to their prayer because the one who silences storms arose and silenced the storm. So how is it that I was in the storm, I called on you, you came, and then you called me of little faith? It's because the Lord had expected them to speak to the storm. He, he, when the storm came, the kononia in their heart was supposed to be their response. However, you can't legislate. Here, I, I, I'll try and make this very simple. You cannot legislate what you've not set in your altar. In other words, you don't have the legislative power to speak to things if there's no kononia in your heart. So the authority to legislate is determined by the strength of the altar and the kononia that takes place in your heart. And what is it that determines that? How much word you put down your spirit. So all these things, are, and that's why for me, Bible study is, is so, it's such a precious moment because you are, you are building yourself up. And sometimes it's like, it's like boring. You know, I, I, I've, I've often said to people, developing a prayer life is not easy. I've said this over and over, and I'll say it over. And, because because you, it, it's, it's a shift, you see. You are not just exercising the flesh. It's like real, true exercise, you know. <laughs> I saw somebody this morning on social media. Their status was, spirit of Jim, fall on me. <laughs> There's no spirit of Jim that is going to follow, fall on anyone. Yeah. Right? You, you've, you, you have to arise and you have to do it. I've often had this question, how do you build a consistent prayer life? I've, I've got an answer for that. You pray. It's like studying, ne? If you want to get your master's or your MBA, the spirit of study is not about to fall on you. <laughs> you, you li so, so, so also with spiritual discipline, but, but what you are doing, all these things is that you are setting yourself up. It's, make the, another example, I, I hope I'll get to, to this. It's like dreams. I remember having a dream in 2003 and in 2013 having the exact same dream that I had in 2003, 10 years later. And I thought, usually what happens there is that it's conversation. Is for you, for me, Pastor Joy knows there, it's a type of a land that when you move out, it pulls you back in. You see this thing of just queen people always moving back to, to the Eastern Cape. Like, okay, then I come to Johannesburg and I try and do something. And then before I know it, man, things are bad in Johannesburg. Hey, I'm on a bus back to Eastern Cape. And then, okay, then I'm going to be in the Eastern Cape another. If, when you study, that, you see that there's a pattern here. That this person keeps going back home usually is a battle against the land. You need the call of Abraham out of the land and do not take with you lot or stuff that keeps calling you back in the land. You know there are other people that when they get married, they have strong moms, ne? Who always put this demand on them that their marriages almost collapse because of their mother. Sometimes it's not the mother, it's the battle of the land. The mom just has an open door to put a demand so that the man is locked in the mother's house. So that the land keeps taking advantage of, of, uh, of them. Okay, let, me, let me be a little bit more graphic. A friend of mine that I grew up with, his dad is late now. His dad was a Christian, but he always had affairs. You know? And where we're from, Bebatu Isoga, you know? 
and all his girlfriends were accepted at his mother's house. His mother literally aided this bad behavior in the name that, in fact, that wife that you're supposed to have married, you never even, I never really liked her. That has nothing to do with one person not liking another. It's the land taking advantage of a man. And because he's a fool, his labor worries him. He never makes it into the city. Make sense to you? Okay. So some of you men fight to stay in the land. And it's like, hey, since I moved into Midland or Pretoria, so wherever you're from, it's like, hey, hey, all hell break has broken loose. For, I don't know peace here. Hey, maybe I should just, let's just, let's just go back home. Do not. You go back home, it's going to be worse. Fight that thing here and, and overcome it here. You heard me, ne? Yeah. Okay. Loud and clear. Hmm. So this is your coming out, okay, this is your coming out time, he said. When you hear something like that, sometimes it can be intimidating. But realize the Father is a loving God. And he will never ask you to relinquish one set of circumstances if he did not have something far, far better. With these decisions will come greater anointing and opening of doors that have been closely tied against you in the past. You are walking into what others are merely waiting for. Do you know how the children of Israel came out of Egypt? and later out of the desert? Let me explain this. If you're going to move forward, God will always ask you to lay down one set of circumstances. But as a loving father, he, he usually has something that's far much better for you. You know, transitions are, are hard. I've, I've defined what transition is. Transition is, I know where I'm not supposed to be at, but I'm really not sure about where I'm supposed to go. But I know that wherever where I'm at right now, I'm not supposed to be there. The time, that season is over. And if you put me there, I know that, you know what, this is just over. If you ask me, so where are you going? That's transition. It's very intimidating. It's very difficult. It's a, it's a, so what, when you transition, you walk into stuff that other people are merely waiting for. People are, people are waiting. The Lord said to me, he said, do not wait for the waves to come at you. Run into the ocean. Because whilst you say you are waiting on me, I am saying I am waiting on you. And so transitions are moments where you must take that step of faith and say, I am going to do it. Don't wait any longer. Step in. I think this word is more relevant now than it was five years ago. I am telling you. <laughs> I am telling you. It's hitting me so hard. I see why the Lord wanted me to really uh, get, get into this. It says, then he says, with these decisions will come greater anointing and open doors that were, closely tight, that were closed tightly against you in the past. With these decisions will come a greater anointing. With what? decisions will come greater anointings and greater doors. The greater anointing and greater doors are there, but God is waiting for you to make certain decisions. You, you, have, you must make these decisions. And then it says then, doors that were tightly closed against you. So, at the time that the Lord gives me this word, we've at the time had a, a church in Mami Lodi, that be a whole church, so we had moved out of the beer hall. No? We got a piece of land and, um, and we were busy with a, a building project. You know, we had, we, we had damp gardens there. And we, you know me, I like excellent stuff. No? Yeah. And so we just like, we want to have like the best church in Mami Lodi. And, um, and, and, and we were going to put a marquee and we dug a foundation, a small foundation, because like, we're just going to put a slab. Ne? Small foundation like this, put a slab. God gives me a vision of, um, 
<clears throat> not PwC, what's the other accounting firm on Allendale? Deloitte, is that Deloitte? You know, I watched that building come up. Mr. Ompi, I don't know if you saw it when it was coming. Do you remember how deep the foundations were? You know, you'll see big trucks looking this small on those foundations. And the Holy Spirit, I had an open vision of that foundation. And I had an, I, an, an open vision of the foundation of that little slab that was not even up till the ankle that we had built there. And God said to me, he showed me that foundation. He said, this is what I have for you. And he said, if you build here, for as long as you leave, this will be the depth of your foundations. And I'm asking you to relinquish that because this is what I have for you. But you must understand that this time we've taken offerings, ne? and we've already prophesied that God said this is the land. And, 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 and we've made promises and we had ordered a, a steel structure, my key in Devon already, we paid a deposit at, at, at this stage, we're just waiting for September so that we, we're going to move into the, into the land. And God says, this is not the land, the land of, your, of, your, of your anointing, and I want you to leave this land. What had happened was that in January, the, the church that we had there was almost coming into, into its third year, like just great light church right now. But in that third year, no saints, if I were to tell you, things were so difficult. The church was not growing. And this anointing, has always been there. I think I was even deeper in the word then than I am now because I had to tone down over the years so that I can build an audience that can hear me uh, over, over, over time. Nothing. So I thought, maybe let me just ask God. Why it took me two years to ask God, you wonder, is this, ow. Oh. But why didn't you ask God to begin with? Then two years later, I asked God. In January, God said to me, Mark July. And there were some people that, and I told them, God said we must mark July, and he told me everything that was going to come. When we got to July, July, he gave me that vision. And he was saying to me, if you let go of this circumstance, but let me tell you what happened. When I was in that land, so I pretty much spent about five years in Mamilodi because we, we had about two years of just praying in the place and doing some home sales before we actually planted the church. In the five years that I was in that place, every door in my life shut for five years, I, I was stuck. The strangest thing ever. So before, I used to have an itinerary ministry. Um, Slee, you remember when I, used, I, I did some conferences in Soshanguve when you guys were in varsity? And at least we had like, what, over 200 students that would came out or so? Yeah, the, in the night services, that, that hall down there, uh, we used to, we packed up that hall. And I'd had many other meetings prior to that. Slee, you were in varsity 15 years ago, isn't it? Yeah, 15 years ago when Slee was in varsity, I was doing con prophetic conferences then. And, and, and so I had had, and, and quite a busy itinerary. I used to go everywhere, like across the country, and, and I preached and I spoke everywhere. In those five years, I only was invited in a little small church like this uh, in, in Soweto there in a, in a classroom in all of five years. And I could not even see what was going on. You know, when we, when we came out of Mamilodi at the beginning of 2019 when we got this word, that Easter weekend, so Easter was around April, so April is about fourth month. Ne? That Easter weekend, we probably ministered in seven churches in one weekend. You understand that for five years, I was shut. And God did in four months what could not happen in five years because of a decision. Every, you know, people that know, and some, some of the guys are still here, they, I, I can't see them tonight, but they will tell you that the story changed like this. What was it waiting for? The greater anointing and greater doors was waiting for decisions. God says, hold everything loosely because I'm about to give you new marching orders. And I'll tell you, uh, let me just share with you quickly what the marching orders were. Okay, we'll do Bible study next week. It's okay, now. 
but today we just share testimonies. Um, it says, you are walking into what others are merely waiting for. Do you know how the children of Israel came out of Egypt and later out of the desert? Do you guys know how they came out of Egypt and then out of the desert? Can I give you the answer? They came out on their feet. There are some things. Okay, maybe before we get there. They came out of their feet. They walked out of Egypt. They walked out of the desert into the wilderness. There are things that demand that you walk out. Yeah. They, they had to walk out of it. So you got to walk out of it. I know it's simple, ne? but it's so profound. And I said, how did they walk? He says they walk out of it, okay? On their feet, so walk out of it. There are some things, some hidden things you've been believing for that are just, that are just ahead. But he's not going to drop them on you like a prepackaged situation. You have to get engaged and move forward. Let me, I want to talk about this a little bit. He said to me, there are some things that you are believing for that are just ahead. But God is not going to drop them on you like a prepackaged situation. You have to get engaged and move forward. You have to step out of expecting with realization, if God does not manifest the breakthrough, you are going to look foolish. But the Father says, be willing and obedient. Be daring to decree and daring to boast in what I have promised you. Okay, let me explain this a little bit. There are things that we are believing God for and God is saying, I'm not going to drop them. I want you to engage. you walk with me a little longer, you're going to realize that I have learned when I hear God, I obey. Just now recently, um, maybe the leaders will tell you in this church, when we started just doing these renovations, you know, I think the church account was on eight rands. I pretty much mean that there was just nothing on that on that account. But the word of the Lord came. Prepare for summer. Break down the walls. This is going to be a very important summer for you. It's not grace. Ne? It's engagement. You are not going to sit back and just receive grace. For, the, for walking into the city. You engage it. Walk out. Yes, you are believing God for, there are God's promises over your life, but walk out. Do you, you get that? Get engaged. It's yours. Get engaged. Move forward. And here's what he says. He says, you have to step out expecting with realization, if God does not manifest the breakthrough, you are going to look foolish. But the Father says, be willing and obedient. Be daring to decree and daring to boast in what I have promised you. The Father says, remember I told you that this was just a man that appeared to me and he spoke and I, and I started writing these things. But the Father says, <clears throat> I will create the fruit of your lips. I will bless the works of your hands. If you stand idly by waiting, nothing happens. Many forget the admonishing of the angels on the Mount of Ascension. Why stand ye gazing? This is, now I was quoting Acts chapter, chapter, chapter 1. That when Jesus was taken up to heaven, remember the Bible says the angel, the, 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 the disciples, when the clouds took him, they stood up and then two men in white apparel appeared. Why are you standing here gazing? What did he say? Go into the city as you were instructed. Because he had told them, go wait. And they had to wait for about 10 days before the Holy Ghost came. They had to go into the city and go engage. And for them, their engagement was prayer. 
go and engage. It says, many forget that admonition. Why are you standing here gazing? Ah, we're just waiting on God. God says, I am waiting on you. And if you step out, I will manifest the fruits of your lips. If you, if you will speak to it, if you will boast about my promises, if, if you will put your hands on it and do it, I will bless the hands of your, the works of your hands. Okay. Okay, I'm going to, I'm, 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 okay, I'm almost finishing. He said, you have a mental, you have a calling. Can you say that to yourself? Say, I have a mental and I have a calling. Do you believe that? Yeah. You have a mental and you have a calling. The ratification of heaven is upon you for a new assignment and a new territory. The Father is opening new territory to you in this time frame of your life. I am the ultimate territorial spirit, says the Father. Oh man, this one got me. He says, I am the ultimate territorial spirit because God takes territories. If you look into anything that you want to do, whether business or anything like that, realize that they may say, hey, these territories, you know, here when, realize that God the Father is the ultimate territorial spirit. He takes territories. And I'm laying claim for your benefit every land, literally and figuratively, that you put your hands to. I also hear the voice of the mocker. Eish. Say that with me. Say, I hear the voice of the mocker. Yeah. When Nehemiah stepped out, he had to contend with San Balak, who did not want God's people to prosper. Even some suggested they, even some that suggested that they, that they have your best interest at heart, but in reality, they just don't have the faith. Yeah, San Balak. There was a time when Nehemiah had to say to San Balak, man, listen, we are doing a great work. We are not going to come down there. They're saying to him, no, no, come down. He says, no, we are doing a great. Please study the book of Nehemiah. They, he did not want the people, the people of God to prosper. There are people that will reason you out of the things that you have come to believe. I spoke to someone here at church and she was telling me, just shared with me a testimony of how she just, she got out of school and was just like struggling to get work to a degree that she now started, she will walk like company to company with a CV, you know, going to re the reception, I'm looking for work and nothing would happen. And she says, one day God says, just have a midnight prayer. At midnight prayer, God, during prayer, said to her, go on Instagram. Start an Instagram page. Look, do this, do that, do this. And she started doing that. Just, just yesterday I was with a, a, a friend of mine. She did work for, and my friend was telling me, he says, hey, those people must type. I paid them half a million for the work that they did here. And where did that come? It was just an instruction, and she had to do it. You're praying in tongues and, and then God says, do it on Instagram. Start and I will bless it. Make sense, huh? Mm. Stop and don't let people reason you out of it. Don't, don't never let anybody reason you out of it. Some of you, you carry so much destiny. There's another story. So the other time I'm having a conversation with, doc, with Dr. Tim, and he says to me, he says, man, you know, I go to places, and I, I find people that can, can sing so well that I wish I could sing like them. Ne? I'm like, but how you're Dr. Tim, what do you mean? There are people that you wish. But these people... He knows himself that there are people that if you are to be put against him like this, they will really embarrass him. 
But there's something that he found about going into the city. Because that's the key. It's not just laboring, but it's a labor that leads you to the city. Am I speaking in parables tonight? Can you hear me? Because people can reason you out of the things that will cause you to go into the city. And not that they stand with you and they don't want to see you embarrass yourself. They just don't have the faith that is required for you to do what you must do. Okay. We are closing. We are closing. So the, that's the voice of the mocker. And be very careful of it. So they act like they have the best interest in your heart, but in reality, they just don't have the faith. Remember that Peter stepped out of the boat against the advice of the 11 of the most spiritual people in his days. The 12 were the most spiritual. They were most closest to Christ at that time. And when Peter said, Lord, if it's you, let me come, the guys were saying, hey, Peter, Vanagiti, please, man. You have kids, you know that. <laughs> So don't, uh, don't, don't, don't do this. Against the advice. Being a, wat a water walker begins by making up your mind. Are you going to listen to the naysayers or the voice of the one walking towards you on the water? I'll throw in, I'll name drop again there. I have this conversation with Doc and he says to me, you know, this thing that began here on Saturday from a thousand to a hundred thousand. Those of you guys that follow him will see that he's announced Polukwane in this Deben that's coming and a few other cities that are coming. And a well meaning friend said, Man, why don't you maybe like do like Wandra Stadium, you know, and uh, and uh, an F and B and stuff like that? And and he looked me dead in the eye and he said to me, Are you guys you can stay with your concerts of two hundred people? I am going for 100,000 and no one is going to change my mind. Because that's what it takes. You make up your mind and you walk. Being a water walker, you walk towards the voice of the one that has called. Nothing else matters. The only time that Peter drowned, you know the story, man. So if you're going, God is saying you are a water walker. But do not listen to the voice of the mocker. You know these things that don't need money, they need a decision. Hmm. The money is in the decision. If you are so overwhelmed about the demand and the need, you will not do it. You have got to decide and go for it. The rest... But we've decided, I, I, I don't know, I sense some of you guys need to make, you know, it's like I'm saying the same thing I was saying on Sunday here. Because God is saying some people need to make serious decisions. You need to, and this is an opportune time. You know there are things that when God opens a season, it's not about what, how much you have and how much you don't have. You can get into another season and have all the money and not be able to do it because the season just does not allow. And there are seasons that when things open up, you must, you must sense the season. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 5. The Bible says, the man who does not know, it talks about a man who does not know his season. Yeah. You, you, you're as good as a beast. So you don't know your season. So when a, when, a, when a demand is put on you, please respond. Okay. Am, am I speaking to the right people tonight? I'm, I'm not a false prophet. Ne? This is your now season, a time for audacious acts of faith, an expectation that leaves no stone unturned in the prosecution of your flesh. Your flesh and others at every point of, of enmity and carnality must be militated against. Should I, I say that again? Your flesh and others and every point of enmity 
and carnality must be militated against. You must be so radical against your flesh and anything that is the voice of the enemy that you really rise up against, militate against it. As the flesh meets its end, so your spirit will soar into a new place of authority. Make it specific. Keep it relevant and act now, says the Father. This is the year that I render to you the double. Oh, man. Joseph gave a special portion to Benjamin that confused and upset his brothers. Joseph is a type of Christ in that story, and you are one of the many who he is unashamed to call his own. Others may, others may look the other way and ignore what you are facing, but God says, I am here. I am your ever-present help in the midst of the demands that you are facing. There are people around you who won't get the favor of God on your life because they are thinking is that your action of faith won't always be convenient for them. The Father says, it is, the Father says that is how favor works. The favor on your life is for a double blessing and a double benefit with both barrels right now in the name of Jesus. With that comes double responsibility. I want you to identify and strengthen your relationship with those leaders I am calling you to walk in accountability to. Be willing and correctable. You can't go where I am not taking, you can't go where I'm taking you as a lone garment, a lone garment, so to speak. I set the solitary in families. I'm calling you up to your tribe and to your place amongst my people in the season, says the Father. Hear that? You are not going to go where you're, you're going alone. Identify people that are supposed to be around you. Hmm. Somebody says, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. There, there are places that you have to go with people. He, he, the Bible says he set the, the lonely in families. Identi identify those, okay? Identify your tribe. Because we can talk a lot about those people. But I want to read this word and, and close. I'm not willing for you to move forward one more day without your highest heart's desire and greatest dream fulfilled. You, you hear? Not, not another single day without your highest heart's desire and your dream fulfilled. I am all about joy and joy unspeakable beyond your expectation. But the secret to living in the first lane of my now blessing in your life is to let go of your natural understanding and follow the prompting of my peace in your situation. Can I say that again? This is the secret. The secret to living in the first lane of my now blessing in your life is to let go of your natural understanding and follow the prompting of my peace in your situation. If you like control, control causes you to panic. And when you panic, you must fix it yourself. And God says, no, let go of your understanding. Can you follow my peace in this? He says, this is the secret to the first lane of my blessing. Hmm. And this word is just blessing me so much tonight. Thank you, Lord. My peace will take you where your understanding and rational cannot go. Your marching orders are this. If you can, please write this down. God then at this time gave me these three marching orders, which I believe that now that we are, been, we are in just this change of seasons, it says, number one, do what you see the Father doing. That is John chapter 5, verse 19. Do what you see the Father doing. So if I'm going to do anything, the first thing is, Father, what are you doing? You know, because you're looking for the prompting of his peace. Number two, have no opinion. Oh, that is very hard. <laughs> have no opinion, and this is uh, Matthew 7, 1. When we say have no opinion is 
If you ask me, I don't know until God speaks. God, God the Father, my opinions on this matter, unless I have a word of the Lord about it, I don't know. Number three, he said, relinquish the outcome. Right? Relinquish the outcome. Yeah, Matthew 7, 1 says, judge not that you may not be judged. That is, just don't have an opinion on, on anything. I want to say to us that, you know, this, it doesn't depend on you, it depends on the Father. And he is so true and he's so good that I said a statement here that there's no story that ends bad with God. There isn't. If you would just turn the stuff to him, he will, he will work it. So, number one, do what you see the Father doing. That is John 5, 19. Number two, have no opinion. Matthew 7, 1. Number three, relinquish the outcome. Put it up for me in John 12, 24. And as you apply yourself to these mandates, you will be, pre you will be pressing into increasing pressure. Yo. As you apply yourself into this mandate, you will be pressing into increasing As you apply yourself to this mandate, you'll be pressing into increasing pressure. Pressure will just increase. It's not like, uh, you know, I had, I had the word of the Lord. I'm going to go for it. I've made a decision. And you are going to come up against pressure. Here's a word of wisdom. You must get to a point where there's things that you don't avoid, but you learn how to deal with them. Yeah. You can face up things and then you just decide to collapse and throw a tantrum. Or you can decide... Okay, it's come again. We must deal with this thing once and for all. It, because for as long as you don't deal with it, everything left undone always comes back. So this tantrum, you know, your apostolo, ulampea matsoko that day, kwa for five days, now naksat If you keep doing that, it's going to keep coming back. Because it requires that it's dealt with decisively. And you know the weapon of the enemy is fear. So it causes you to become afraid. The pressure is so insurmountable, you, 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 you become, and once you go into fear, you can't see answers. I told you this, that the Lord said to me, anything you go through in your life, I've prepared you two years ahead. But he said to me, anxiety causes you to forget your training. Once you become anxious and fearful, you forget everything that God has actually been saying, saying and training you from. Me, that's why I write prophetic words. Like I've got a whole thing here on my thing that is just everything that God has said to me. There are moments where I feel the weight of the world on my shoulders. And I just take prophetic words. I start walking around. Father, this is what you said. I read it out and I say, this is the reality of, the reality of my life. It's very important that you do that. So go for pressure. But you will break out into the kingdom where everything you say and do will become as effective as if I did or said it, says the Father. The authority that you are given in the midst of pressure is that when you speak, man, it will be as if God himself spoke. Your, his words will be as powerful in your own mouth. Amen. Amen. And shall we stand, Bongi? Just, 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 just come up. Let's let's just stand together, and um, we're gonna we're gonna pray. Uh, we just we're just gonna we're just gonna pray together. Did you hear the word this this evening? Are you blessed by this word? Yeah. 
So good. Eh? Such a good word. I know. I am, I'm going to go back home and just, and, just, and just sit through it myself. Because I feel the spirit of prophecy, I'll say this. Remember I said we are multidimensional, so I'm going to shift from a teacher to a prophet. And the difference with the teacher is that the teacher instructs, but the prophet speaks into the shift of, rea of realities. And, and, and just under this prophetic anointing, you know, I saw what looked like butler bars being lifted. And I think that's Isaiah, Isaiah uh, 54, where the Bible says, I'll open uh, the doors of the doors of iron, or the gates of iron, you know, I'll, I'll break them asunder. And that's what I sense the Lord is doing uh, 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 right now, that if there's any of you guys that is like, like, this feels like a prison, that God is breaking that. You know, the Lord said, I will give you a double blessing, the double portion that Joseph conferred on, on, on his brother Benjamin and it confused the rest of the brothers. Why are you conferring a double blessing on him? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just seeing this. But, but in my vision, these butler bars, they're not broken. They are lifted up. There's like, there's like an invisible hand that says what has stood in front of you I say it with such clarity. What it's this butler pass that have stood is, is the anointing of Cyrus. I, I will cause this butler pass just by an invisible hand, the invisible hand of the book of Daniel, who the Bible says, and an angel came, and, and, there, were, and there was a stone that was cut out. And that stone, when it fell into the earth, it grew into such a big mountain that it filled the rest of the earth. Please hear me. You know, I've given words that seemed so weak. I was like, oh, that had no drama in it. It's been all those words that seemed so weak and very less dramatic that God just put something on it. You know? Hmm. My brother at the back with the glasses. Can I? Yes, you say. Can I say, just say something on, just, just confer a blessing on you. Can I? Yes. Just, just hold hands with your, with your, with your wife. Is that okay? Yeah. I speak a blessing upon you. The same blessing that Joseph put on his brother, his youngest brother, Benjamin. Joseph will not speak to the rest of his brothers. Or when he sent them to go get the, his father, he said, leave Benjamin with me. Because Joseph had a very special relationship with Benjamin. And he treated him so well. He, he gave him a double portion spirit. And, and I, I stand in my office, and I, I don't know, I feel like I'm going to speak this as a, as a father and a prophet in the spirit. To say there is a double blessing conferred on you right now. I, I see you spiritually. I see you at a place. Like I see this massive warehouse, right? And in this warehouse, it's as if they are, they are producing, you know, uh, steel sheets, like zincs and, and stuff like that. Like a massive factory where they are pro producing steel sheets. And I see a white woman open a door for you in a place that looks like that, like a massive factory. I'm not sure what is it that you do professionally, but I see like this massive factory, this place, you know, it's like it's a factory and then there's like an office and I see I see a, a white woman open double doors for you. And God says, I must tell you that he will open double doors for you. He will open double doors for you and those that door will have something to do with the factory where they manufacture steel sheets. And, and I want to say to you, sir, I break your father's curse over your home. I break your father's curse over your home. The things that have come from your father will not settle over your home. 
will not settle over your home. Will not settle over your home. So Father, we can we just stretch our hands to, towards, towards him? Then? Father, we just bless their home, Lord. We stand right now as a company of believers in the name of Jesus that there's been a season of transition, it's been a season of relinquishing one circumstance for another. That Lord, now we confer the blessing of Benjamin on them in the name of the Lord Jesus that you cause him in this season that a double door both spiritually and naturally gets open now for him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ thank you father in Jesus name and I hear very clearly the father say tell him that he is going into the next seven weeks are determined by heaven as weeks of changing the story like the story changes I don't know why seven weeks but it's like in the next seven weeks the Lord says I must tell you that the story changes you know I feel like all of you here we just came for you tonight yeah I feel such a strong uh, strong thing the only person the first person that I ever said this to was Dimaka so they on a Wednesday night I told Dimakatsu about a house that she was trying to buy. And I told her, I said, I've, it's like I, heaven is leaning over her life, interested. And she was trying to buy a house. And then all hell broke loose on that house, didn't it? But you got it anyway. And God told you that word so that your faith does not fail. It's not like, I, the prophet, just jinxed the whole thing, you know. <laughs> it's so that your faith does not fail. And I just feel like that, that the next seven weeks, there may be certain things that happen, but God is saying this to you so that your faith does not fail. Because at the end of it, you'll be ushered through double doors. I can tell you so many testimonies. You know, there was a, there was a lady here at our church where I called Apiwe, and I called another Apiwe. And it was like, Apiwe, Apiwe. Eh? And she got a... And then I gave her, on the basis of calling up here and another up here, I gave her a, a, a word about these two names. And she got a job at a company that is also like a Johnson & Johnson also. Uh, you know, and the prophetic word and the action that goes, I, you remember I had, to, I had to get up here and another up here and this lady. And we were walking up and down here and it just did not make sense. But it was what God, what, what, what God, what God was saying. I don't have to say this. I don't have to say it. But my words don't fall to the ground. I, I, I don't think I need to say this, but the people that have been around me know. And it's not because of me, but it's because of the office appointed. It's the implications of the office that has been given to me. And now I declare over you, double doors. And Father, won't you just do it for everybody here tonight that just needs, that just needs double doors, Father. Not just one door, but a double door anointing. Yeah. Movements where, where, you know what God said to me guys the other day? He says, he says, I want to open not just one, but ten doors for you. And what you decide in maturity, what door to walk through. And he said to me, I delight in doing that. We are people who, who carry promises over our lives. And that's why you should not walk around like you don't have promises over your life. Things will happen because life is difficult. But when it happens, tend to the promise. In moments where it feels like it's, these are moments of loss and discouragement, tend to the promise. It is so powerful. It will never fail. And Father, we speak an unfailing promise. Promises that have been abandoned promises that look like will never happen now in the name of Jesus we confer resurrection life on it oh God because you said we will you don't desire for us to go through another day without our highest heart's desire so unleash it oh God release it oh God tonight thank you father thank you lord I just 
just want you to just take, just take in a little bit what's taking place here. Just take in just a little bit. Some of those um, lights that people carry at the airport when they lay the plane is going to land, you know, and, they are and, and God, God is saying there's a way that's been opened. It's the highway of the Lord. Can we just say that it's the way to the city that where many of us have labored, where we felt like it's been a labor of food, God says it ceases now and I cause you to enter the city. You never have to do relationships that never lead to the city. You never have to do business that never leads to the city. You never have to do ministry that never leads into the city. Anything that you do with your own hands, anything that you touch, you will, it will not be the labor of fools that does not lead to the city. Thank you, Holy Ghost. And Father, let these angels right now begin to usher us into the pathway, that highway into the city tonight. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Bye, bye.